This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I'm honored to have a conversation with the celebrated artist Stanley Whitney. Known for his vibrant use of color and rhythmic compositions, Stanley will take us through the journey of his illustrious career, including its pivotal moments, challenges, and triumphs. Stanley currently has two major exhibitions of his work on view. First, a survey of new work titled By the Love of Those Unloved at Gagosian's 980 Madison Avenue location in New York. And second, a comprehensive retrospective titled How High the Moon at the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. And now, a conversation about the joy of stacking color with artist Stanley Whitney. Stanley Whitney, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense Podcast. Uh, Stanley, it is, uh, it's a busy time for you. you. You currently have a career retrospective at the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. Uh, now through uh, May 26th, and you currently have a show that's up starting this week and running through June at Gagosian's 980 Madison Avenue Gallery in New York. Stanley, you know, a lot of times with artists, I like to give them an opportunity to start the conversation by answering a hypothetical, which is, let's say you're at a dinner party next to a perfect stranger who has no idea who you are. Where do you begin to explain to them what your work consists of. That's a hard one. Uh, I try not to. Um, I, I think just through the conversation, they it, the more they ask, and the more I, I, I say I'm a painter, and then they ask, what do I paint? I say I'm an abstract painter, uh, what's your subject matter? And I just say color, but I, and I, I usually say, you can look at it online. You can, you can look at it. Um, there's lots of information on me and, and, and do that. And uh, see where that goes, you know. Then you see the response, whether they're, you know, you know, sort of how much they're involved with that, or how much they really want to know about that, about you know, the contemporary art world and and painting in itself, and what kind of paintings they like, or do they look at paintings or not look at paintings, or and or or asking what, what do they do, you know, and trying to get a sense of really who they are and how much they really want to dive into that, or if it's a light conversation. So what what do you typically find? Do you find that people have enough knowledge that you can go a little bit deeper and explain a, a, at a little bit deeper level other than just kind of a, a snapshot on your phone? I mean, do people ask that question really wanting to know the answer or are they just trying to make polite conversation? Well, that's what you want to find out. You know, you know, you want to find out whether they really want to know something or whether it's like conversation. Uh, you sort of want to find out just really... Is worth is this worth your time or not? You know, uh, or whether they're just, you know, now with the internet, people know who I am, and people usually talk about uh, a painting they saw of mine or how much they like the paintings. Or it's usually something really personal, because now I think with um, you know Instagram and everything else, people have a sense of who these artists are. I mean, you know, I, I get stuff on the street now. People know who I am, and they're usually happy to see me. Or a lot of times, people who stop me uh, even have paintings, and they talk about how they like the paintings, where they are. You know, I get up in the morning, I see it, it makes my day. So it's usually really positive things that we really talk about. Uh, and then a lot of people are respectful like that. They don't really want to talk too much or bother me too much. So it, it's interesting in terms of that one. At a dinner party, it's different, of course, depending who you're across, sitting with, um, you know, depending on the artist or how deep we go. So things like that. Because if it's, if it's something like that, you can talk about the art world, what shows you've seen or, you know, where you've been traveling, things like that. You know, I, I think one of the first words you used to describe your work uh, was abstract artist. That wasn't always the case. And I guess that's uh, that's can probably be true for any abstract artist. I mean, no one invites you into the art world through uh, the keyhole of abstraction. I mean, you're, you're kind of brought through figuration and and then, you know, you wind up there, right? What 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 was your journey? Yeah, like? I mean, if, you know, because it's true. If you say you're an abstract artist, then they're sort of like lost right there. Either they're lost there or they're 
have a sense of what that is. You know, it's kind of a way of really seeing really, you know, how much they are really involved with with the art, you know, they are in, and how much they bring to it, you know, um, and where they are with that. Because, you know, you don't really want to go and talk about it if, if you're, I, you know, I mean, I was an educator and I taught for like 35 years. So, I, but I don't really want to sit around and educate people <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I, I get the sense of of listening to you talk about your work. I get the sense that you want to make work that people don't need to be educated to appreciate your work. You don't have to give them an education. They should find something in your work naturally that it, because your work's very much tied to color, and right. it seems like the stories you hear of people interacting with your work, they have an emotional response that comes from places of reminiscence and nostalgia. Well, um, it's true. I mean, usually people who have the work or live with the work, uh, if they approach me and talk about it or I meet them, they talk about, oh, I, I get up in the morning and I, I love your work. You know, it really makes my day. I think interesting, actually, the show last night, I, someone saw a painting and the, they told me that the the blue made them cry. And this is like the Stendhal, uh, you know, thing where, you know, people see art and they get emotional. I think it's Stendhal, it's called Stendhal uh, Syndrome. So that was kind of strange because I knew the per I knew the person uh, and they didn't quite know what it was. And they asked me about that blue what blue was that? How I made that blue, which I don't really remember. Because uh, I I, when I paint a painting, if I make a blue, I make enough for that one area, and that's that. I don't keep the blue or something like that. Um, but people have all kinds of responses. It's you know, people. It's usually really positive how much they uh, get from the paintings. Uh, it's usually emotional. I mean, I don't get into too much of the story. They just say. They really appreciate it. They love the work. And it just really uh, sort of like makes them, I don't want to say happy, but makes them really positive, you know, in terms of their lives. And then that's, and that, I feel that's what the, the work's about. You know, sure. you know, that's, uh, and so the, it's always usually a great response. I usually don't get, I don't, you know, but it's usually people who own the work. I mean, it happens from all different kinds of people, all different kinds of places. People approach me with that. I mean, uh, I was in the studio the other day shopping for something, and someone approached me, a couple approached me, and, and said, we have a painting. We just love it so much. Uh, you know, I get up. I just really just, I love it. I, it just, it's just fabulous. I just, I mean, they, they don't have a lot of words for it, actually. You know, they, they, just, they just say, oh, I just love this painting. It just really makes my day i i look at it all the time in the morning at night i just you know just really it feels really good so that's that that's kind of what i want anyway from the painting people to have do you consciously look for that feeling when you're making it i mean no I, I, no 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 uh when i when i'm making it i'm too busy trying to figure out how to make the painting and trying to figure out really you know what it is i you know no i don't consciously do that but i you know but but that's kind of what i want when i look at a saison you know or something like that that's kind of what i want from a painting you know what i mean that's what i mean i i think what i got into painting is because of that you know my when i first started painting and really started going to art school um i was in columbus ohio and they had a small saison and, and i used to go to look at that painting every day it just it just felt good you know what i mean and so the that's kind of what I want from painting, painting, you know, I mean, the painters I like, that's kind of what I want from painting. Last week, I was having a conversation with Jeffrey Deitch for the, the podcast, and he had done an exhibit where he had invited 30 contemporary artists to respond to the Dejeuner Celebre. We were talking about how the best contemporary artists, the best artists, even over art history, they're always in a dialogue with artists from the past. That yeah. you know, great contemporary artists are real students of art history, and they're in a dialogue. I know that you have a number of names that I feel like you are you are in a dialogue with. Uh, I'm definitely in a dialogue. It depends, you know, it depends where you are in your life with your paintings. But I'm definitely there are painters like Cezanne or Edward Monk. Um, 
you know, Mati not no, those I would say like Cezanne, Edward Monk, I liked when I was 18 years old. Hmm. And I, I still, they're still needy for me. I, you know, I still need them. They're still very important to me. And so that dialogue has been going on forever. I mean, now there's a big Edward Monk show in, uh, in Norway, and I'm going to go see it. And I've seen, I've been in that museum a couple of times, but they built a new museum. So it's even bigger now. So there's certain artists, you know, and then there are other artists who I like when I was 18, like, Egon Schiele or something, or mm -hmm. Oscar, who I liked when I was like 18, but I don't really need those painters, or I'm not involved with those painters. So it depends where you are with your work, I think. Uh, but then there are the ones that are just really always there, like Mondrian's always there. You know, so there, there, there are certain painters that are, that are there with you all the time. So, and then as you... Uh, like now I'm an older, you know, painter. It's like now you think about how to keep, you know, I made a lot of paint, I have a retrospect, how to keep this thing alive. Like what, how do you feed it? Because when you're a younger painter, you know, you're going to the museum, you're looking at things and stealing things and trying things and trying to figure out what paint is or what surface is or, you know, what space is and, and, and stealing things and trying to figure things out. That I've done already. So now I, I need different things from painters, but there are other painters I, who I just love. You know, it's just, it's a love affair. You know what I mean? And it's a long love affair. Like like I say, Don, it's a long love affair, you know, I, I, I think forever. It depends, it depends where you are. Now, I've, I've heard you talk about Mondrian before. The At the Dallas Museum of Art, they have on their permanent uh, display five different Mondrians lined up next to each other chronologically over the course of his career, eight, nine years apart for each one. Right. And I, I've heard you talk before about how you, you've found some inspiration in, in how Mondrian evolved from those landscapes and those trees to Boogie Woogie here. Well, when you're young, you're trying to, you're trying, it's like putting together a recipe, you know, you need a little of this, a little of that. And that was something, even when I saw, I went to a Mondrian, I would tell the story, I went to a Mondrian show at the Guggenheim. I must have been in the 60s, even before I was painting abstract work. I liked the way he moved step by step. And I, and I thought that's what I want to do. Uh, and that, that became very clear to me, step by step. Um, so I think with my work, if you follow the work and, see the work, even in retrospect, you can see, you know, step by step, how I sort of evolved and how the work you know, came about. So that's something I got from, from, from Mondrian, you know, and, um, you know, Mondrian is an odd painter because, you know, you know, I was, I read a book, you know, the big show at the Byler, I bought the book of Mondrian to read about him. And, you know, like he's in Paris, you know, with Picasso and uh, that, but there's not much dialogue with him and Picasso. You know, and I'm thinking like if I had been there in that time, you know, because I love Picasso so much too, you know, it's like I'm wondering what's not interested in Picasso at all. You know what I mean? So it's it's interesting in terms of, of that. I think, wow, that's really interesting that he wasn't, you know, involved with that. Uh, he, he was someone who really was, he was a real strong individual who really worked on his own way. I mean, he really, like he said, I'm in pain. Paint it. But, and then the odd thing about him is he loved to dance. You know, he loved to go out dancing all the time. He was a big dancer. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of like you're, you're always trying to pick up pieces of like how this artist made this work, where did it come from, what fed him. But you really see the Netherlands in the work. You know, you really see that, you know, even the way they're laid out, lined out, it's like, it's like the North. And it's interesting is the North they weren't interested in um, French painting. You know, they they were not interested in, you know, uh, Impressionism and all that. I mean, the Americans were more than the French. You know, so you sort of think about, oh, that's, in, you know, all those things. So as I get older, you know, I sort of read more. You know, I, I, I think I have a big reading practice, so I read just as much as I paint, maybe, you know, now, because uh, I have a better sense of my work. Uh, early on, you know, I, I was just too busy in a museum looking at work to really read as much as I do now. So, you know, um, so you're sort of thinking, so you're always looking through how to, you know, now it's really like little things or big things that are the how to feed the work. Before there were big things that feed the work. Now there are little things that are really big things for me that feed the work. 
I think from the outside, people kind of assume that an artist, uh, there, that there's a trajectory that is kind of a straight line. But the, the truth is there are starts and stops. And for, for some artists, there are more starts and stops than others. Can you talk a little bit about how you are able to remain persistent to your calling even within a career that had its shares of starts and stops. You know, it's interesting because, you know, with the show I have right now, a lot of people were talking about how, how did I, or how do I, how are these paintings better than the other paintings when they seem so much the same, but they seem better, what's going on with them? Um, mine's been very consistent. I mean, I, I, I think early on, uh, probably in the 70s, 60s and 70s when I was young there were lots of starts and stops because you know in terms of because I came to uh, painting figurative stopped doing that in, in, in undergraduate school had no idea you know because I was much more involved with like you know the European paint like Velasquez and Goya and all that and the German expressionism um, and then that came to an end because I didn't like the conversation and then I didn't know what I didn't know what I wanted to paint. Then I started drawing landscapes and being outside doing that, which I hadn't done before. Um, and then when I came to New York, I everyone's working in acrylic, so I stopped painting in oil and went to acrylic to try you know see what that was about to reinvent things. And then that came to a stop because I, I didn't I didn't like I didn't like the acrylic. I couldn't really do things much with acrylic when I wanted to do and um, trying to figure out how I can make color a subject matter. So then there were lots of, lots of really struggle, struggle, struggle. Uh, and then once I figured things out, maybe more in the 80s, 90s, from, you know, when I was in Italy, things got more clear to me. Um, then it was pretty much smooth sailing. I mean, I was pretty much on my way, you know what I mean? But, the, but really early on, I, I, I would say, you know, I was in debt to art supply stores. You know what I mean? I was just trying <laughs> But I feel like go to drawing, stop painting so much, and and that, and work on paper and not canvas because it was costing me too much money. So I, 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 but then I was really working hard, you know. I mean, in a different kind of way. Now I'm not saying I'm not working hard now, but in a different kind of way. So there's lots of starts and stuff. But my work's pretty consistent, really. You you talk about drawing there, and that's that's something else that's been coming up a lot with artists is just how important that drawing practice is, even if it's not the end product, just in terms of the the method of play, the method of discovery. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's the most important uh, thing to do. I think every artist has to reinvent drawing. You know, I, I think drawing, I learned really on, by, because I tried to paint, 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 paint stuff in the future. I could paint, you know, and it wasn't, I was just making all these terrible paintings and throw them away. And or you know, I and I realized I went to drawing and drawing kind of saved me. Drawing I really is a, is really the key. I mean I'm a really great colorist and color is something I always could do. I can make things better with color, but in order to figure out space and where I was and where things were in space, uh on the canvas and uh drawing with the so drawing is the key. You know, I I th I think I think it was uh who said all you need is, is red, black, and white to make a painting. Because I mean, um, but I, so because but drawing is the key to me. So I, I encourage every artist to do draw. You know, I think. And when I came to New York, people really people were painting because I came in the sixties. People weren't painting that much. It, painting was considered after Barnard Newman kind of New York school was kind of over. Um, but I. Gravity is the artist who drew a lot. And that's like Bryce. Bryce Martin was a big thing for me because he, he drew. I saw his drawings, you know, and I thought draw and I, and drawing kind of saved me. And even when I was in school, when I, you know, when Gus and, and the, I didn't know what to paint, I was, I went to drawing, you know. So drawing, I think, so I have, I have a huge drawing practice, you know, I, I, I have tons of drawings, um, black and white color, watercolors sometimes too, but. I works on paper, but drawing is really something that I think that really gives me lots of possibilities of where the future might be, you know, or where, where things will lead me. So drawing, I think, is it. 
at that time that you you were working with Philip Guston, that would have been a, a point in his career when he would have been painting in a way a lot like drawing, right? I mean, a, a lot about heavy, thick line, right? Yeah, he was drawing a lot too. I didn't realize. I mean, I didn't see his work then, you know, so he didn't show the work. Uh, but I, he was drawing a lot too. I mean, um, it was interesting because I didn't, looking back at it now, I, I see that, you know, by the time I didn't realize that, you know, I was kind of, I was kind of reinventing myself and he was busy reinventing himself and we were crossing paths. Um, but yeah, drawing, he was drawing a lot. Yeah. What we think of as a prototypical Stanley Whitney composition these days, when did you first stack what would you like to call them? I, I think I think you're averse to the word grid. Well, you know, the, the it is, you know it is a grid. But for me, the grid came out of the a- ancient world. It wasn't like it was more when I was in Italy and and I was I was teaching in in Rome at the university and I was traveling all everywhere the Romans went and I it was I got involved with the ancient world, not painting, um, ceramics, uh, tour, you know, everything, you know. Um, floor tiles, all of that, you know. And I told them the other night that when I went to the Coliseum, it really was, uh, I was, I thought it was a, had a great human scale. You know what I mean? I, I was so big, but it felt like really, I mean, I thought from one brick to the size of it, it felt really like a human scale for something so big, which I don't feel if I go into a modern building so much. So the ancient, it was the ancient world. That's where I got it. And then I, I, I was, you know, I went to uh, Orvieto to Voltaire. I think I saw a good trashy museum, and they had everything stacked. And I thought, oh, I'll just stack the color. You know, so it just came to me. It's just stack the color. Because I thought, how am I going to set this up? Or what am I going to do? And I, I was looking at that. And I was also looking at um, Mirandi a lot then, too. You know, so that's how I thought about it. And maybe it's because I used to teach art history. I mean, when I look at your your work, you know, I think of the term registers also. You know, the fact that, you know, it's not just a pure grid. They're rows. Yeah, yeah. What I really find interesting is how each row is delineated by a color. And that color, that line of color is one of the blocks of color. And... If I allow myself, I can start thinking, okay, does that mean that that color is on top or does that mean it's behind? Which very much reminds me of a conversation I heard Barnett Newman say one time about his this zipper of white down the middle of his color field painting. He wants people to consider, is this a white line on top of a green field or has the green field split apart, you know, revealing the white beyond? And so I feel like some of that is at play when you have that line of color be uh, in conjunction with w- one of those blocks. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, I, I think people who have the pain, that, that's true. You have all that time to really consider like how they're put together or why they're put together or the order of things because you don't really know the order of things. You, I mean, if I don't tell you where I start, you know, I, I've told people where I started, you, you don't really know that. You know, it's sort of like endless. Uh, and, um, so yeah, all those things, it's, it's true. I mean, that's, I, the paintings really allow the, conver- a lot, the paintings open, open up space so people can have a conversation. I, you know, I want the painting to really open things up. You know, they, they, they open the world up in terms of what the conversation is. The viewer kind of bring, the viewer has lots of room to get involved with them any way they want. You know, in terms of, it's like what you bring to the paintings. You know, mm-hmm. not like um, the story is the story is what the viewer brings. I I sort of like. I just want to open things up. That's what I I do. You know, with that, and then people are allowed to go. You know, to go and anywhere they want. I mean, you can start any 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 day. You can start anywhere in the painting you want. You know, you you know, or maybe you, one day the green just affects you. You know, another day, maybe the lo- you know, maybe the speed of the line affects you, or maybe you know how colors touch affects you. Because I I never know when I paint, you know, where I'm gonna, if I put a blue or a green or out where that where I'm, I feel that that it should stop there, where the borders are. You know, I kind of feel my way through it. 
you know, if I start at the top, I work my way down. How much I paint down? How much I paint across? You know, all those all those things. I kind of want to. I kind of want to break the history of painting. Tell you the truth. <laughs> you know. You know. When I was thinking about your your work, it it struck me that that the stack it creates this really egalitarian use of color. Like you're you're removing emphasis as part of the composition, and you're left with these colors kind of competing with each other on equal footing. Yes. Yes. Very democratic. Yes. I, w- I want, you know, because you can't, you can't have, in my opinion, you can't have a, a one color dominate. They have to, they have to, they have to live together. Uh, they have to be equal, equal uh, and not get in the way of each other, you know, so that you, so that the viewer then can go anywhere, you know, so that, that's, that's a big part of it. That's a big thing in terms of when I work, you know, to get that, color not to be not one color dominate uh that they can really live together that way and and exist together you know as a whole but then you can take them apart as a viewer you know what i mean because some people say oh i like that painting you know it's interesting because some paint some people if they buy the painting that the painting they know right away I, I i want that painting you know what i mean i would never i don't think if you're if people i don't know how they sell them but i wouldn't think you would show people a lot of them and we get too confusing, I would think. Um, but yeah, all those things are yes. It's you know, it's funny. I can make the paintings, but it's very hard for me to see the paintings and to know to know if it's good or not, or or if I should keep going. I just trust myself and think it, the paintings telling me stop, and I stop. You know, and then I then I have to spend time, a lot of time looking at them to see what they are. You know what I mean? I remember hearing Chuck Close say that he had limited mobility after his medical issue. And and when he would work within this constructed system within the grid with like four or five colors, and then the, the canvas would move up and he would go to another row and another row, he would commit himself to thinking about that one square. And then when he got to the end of all of the squares in his grid, he wouldn't go back. And just like I, I'm yeah. just gonna trust that whatever that was is is what it's supposed to be. I I go back sometimes if if I if the painting tells me to. I I try not to. It really it really has to really be like I it has to be the point where the painting that you have to. I don't want to, but sometimes I I do. You know what I mean? Uh, I do, but um, uh, I I you know I try. You know once I. Once you put something down the canvas, you have a relationship. You know what I mean? So you have this blank canvas, you put a mark down, and there is a relationship. But another mark, and then you go from that. So sometimes the paintings will say, you know, I need, you know, that I have, to, I have to change that. You know, I don't want. So it's really like it's really making them tell you what to do. I mean, it's really it's really that kind of dialogue with the painting for me. The paint the paintings really lead me. I mean, once I if I go into the studio and think. Oh, I want to make a painting with red and blue and green, and, uh, yellow or black. It just falls apart. I have to go in and just start, you know, almost randomly. I, you know, I have these little bowls of color, not you know, uh, salad bowls I use to make the color in, and I'll go. I'll start, and I just something hit me, and I'll just take that and mix that color maybe, and and just start there. I just you know, but if I have an idea, uh, then that's not a good idea. I can't do it. I had, to, <laughs> I, had to, I had to be I had to be wide open in the studio. Sure. So, but the but the the paintings I do go back sometimes. Yeah, I do go back. You know, I, I think one of the words I've heard you use most often when when speaking about your own work and your process is uh, the word rhythm. Can you talk about rhythm? Oh yeah, the rhythm. It's like yeah, like somehow the rhythm of the day. Uh, yeah, it's real. It really is. It's like it's really getting into an idea of like um, uh, the rhythm. Uh, you know, it's like I think about that a lot. You know, now I'm I'm sort of out painting in the country more, out in Bridgehampton. I'm always, you know, uh, but yeah, it's like true of getting the, the right, getting things the right rhythm. You know, I think I think you're, I think human beings have this rhythm. I think, you know, you could say the universe has a rhythm. The day has a rhythm. So yeah, trying to get the rhythm. Yeah, that's very important. You know, I'm not real clear about what that is, really, to tell you the truth, you know, but I, I, I think that's really important. 
And um, yeah, that's something I think about a lot. Well, but, you know, I, I think you see it in sports also. I mean, you know, people, yeah. especially I think about basketball, right? You know, people right. getting in the zone. I remember back in the 80s hearing stories about Larry Bird getting to the gym before a game to make 300 jumpers, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, how do you get the juices flowing? How do you how do you right. find that zone, right? Right, yeah. No, because that's what I draw a lot. And the draw, if I'm not painting, I draw a lot. It's almost like staying in shape. You know what I mean? So because the paintings take a lot of drawing time because of oil painting. So, you know, when I paint one at a time, I don't paint two or three at a time, I paint one at a time. And so if I'm not painting, I'm drawing. It's like the staying in rhythm. Uh, it's like almost staying in shape. You know what I mean? So I make a lot of gouaches, watercolor, pencil drawings. And I'm always, so I'm staying in rhythm. You know, that's the big thing. If I don't paint for a while, you know, I don't go in and just start painting. I, I draw a lot before I get in, into the painting, the painting. So it's like that, staying in rhythm. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, it definitely in sports, it's true. I mean, you see that with a team. It's not, you know, not in rhythm or a player, just out of rhythm, you know. Or it's like, I mean, like it's like basketball. They pass the ball around. Who takes the shot? You know what I mean? Right. It's someone who's in rhythm. You know what I mean? Who's in that kind of rhythm? So that yeah, that's how I think about painting. You know, I, I've heard you say that drawing for you can almost be kind of like an exit plan. That you know, it allows the possibility for you to reinvent yourself. That you know, regardless of what your paintings are, that that the drawing practice always kind of has unlimited possibilities for where it, where it is and where it might go. Yeah, that's true. You know, I think about that, you know, like, because, uh, you know, people, when I get to New York school, you know, you didn't see too many drawings. Like, you, you know, you didn't see any Rothko drawings or a few Barnett Newman drawings, maybe. But Bryce drew a lot, you know. And, um, yeah, I think uh, that's real important. Um, the, the drawing practice um, keeps things open uh, to where things might be, you know, what the future might bring. Lots of possibility where I could go. So there's no, you know, so things are wide open for me to think about, well, I might go here, I might go there. Just possibilities, you know. And I use drawing and paper that way. Certain paper, we'll say a certain paper, I think, oh, this would be great for watercolor. Other paper, I think, would be great for, for you know, pencil drawings. Some paper, I think, is better for colored pencil drawings. So I try to use the material to show me sort of what the possibilities could be. And then I have lots of things I can think about, you know, where I might go, where, where I might, might, might not go, what's possible. So to keep it up wide open, you know what I mean? Sure. I, I can't, like I say, I always want to get the idea of opening up space um, for thought, for, you know, for people to uh, wander, you know, wander, mentally wander. I mean, the paintings are really good for mentally wandering, you know? Sure. And I think that's, you know, I mean, it's sort of like the things you have, you know, because paintings do go on the walls. They do go on people's houses, you know what I mean? And um, when you pass them, when you see them, where you have them, you know, it's interesting if you have, you know, if you have them in your bedroom or, or where you have them, you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's sort of curious if you see where you want to hang the work. Right. You know, um, so all those things. So drawing is a big part of it. Draw, you know, like I say, drawing really is it. <laughs> You know, I had heard you say once that your large scale paintings, they're they're pretty much all of a square format these days. And I heard you say once that you chose this format because of its resistance to the rhythm, that it it, it pushes back. You could do it because I, because it doesn't spread out. You know, it's like this it's almost like the center. It doesn't it doesn't spread out. It's not like it's not like well, I chose it too because you know, early on I, I if I worked Horizontally, I kept thinking about landscape, you know, spreading out, which I love that. I mean, I do love all that space, you know. And, um, and I, you know, before I went to Italy, I, I thought things in terms of space, in terms of uh, landscapes, you know, sky. And then uh, Italy architecture came into it. But, um, yeah, that, that, that kind of, and, I, and, and it's true, there's a resistance there in terms of how far it can move, left and right, up and down. I can't continue, you know, for, so it's like staying there, staying, you know, staying in that one spot and just staying there. 
uh, which is now I, I've done some paintings now even this show that are are horizontal. They're eighty by a hundred hundred eighty by a hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, which you know, so I've done some things now because I'm I can paint so frontal, I I can spread out like that. But I, when a square is just and it's such a an ancient thing that I I just like that idea of like it, it, it's just you. So so it's a challenge for me to, to get that in rhythm in that kind of space, that limited kind of space. It's like staying focused, you know, just staying that one spot. It's really something that I uh, I enjoy. I enjoy. So can you talk a little bit about? The titles of your pieces, because you know you're you're not a narrative painter these days. It's not figurative, but your titles have a, a lot of allusion to uh, to music, to to jazz, to even poetry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I never. You know, early on, I, I early I like even the earlier ones. No titles. I couldn't. Really, I didn't know what they were. I couldn't title them. But you know, you know who had great title. I think was Hans Hoffman always had great title. Uh, you know, in in the sixties, seventies, I saw a lot of Hans Hoffman in New York and Emmerich Gallery, and he always had great titles. And I thought, how do they do these? How do they get these words? You know, uh, and you know, um, even Pollock had some great titles, and I I couldn't figure out what what the what my I didn't know even what my work was, uh, but the titles uh, allow me. To bring another aspect of who I am and what how I think to the work. So whether it's political titles, I mean the, the music was always there before I was a painter. I was much more involved with music, you know, early on than I was a painting as a kid. I, you know, Philadelphia, real music city. I got involved with, you know, in the early days in the '60s, people were either jazz people, rock and roll people, or folkies, mm. and they didn't mix. They did not, <laughs> <laughs> and I and I I got involved with really uh, jazz because I really, I just you know I, I was you know as a kid you're looking for who are you well, where are you or how who am I in this world, and you know people like Edward Monk and Eric Dolphy and uh, you know Anna Coleman I just identified with they were my heroes, so the music was always there even before I started painting, and it's a big part of that of my life still I get up in the morning I. I listen to music. I have a good sound system. Uh, I listen to music, you know, all the time. Uh, so that's a big part of my life. Then I got involved with poetry a lot. Um, really, in the eighties, I was in California, seventy, living with a poet, uh, staying with someone, Norma Cole, and I went to a lot of poetry readings. Uh, and I, you know, when you you knew about poetry, you knew you knew how Allen Ginsberg that that worked. And, and and I knew that work, and I, I you know I knew that work a little bit, but um, and you know what is to be a poet? Which you know a true poet is quite amazing. So all that, and then you know all the race things. Uh, the Va was reading, you know Baldwin was so important to me. So it's just these things that are really key to who I am. You know what I mean? So if you didn't line up, if you didn't line up all the paint, you could line up all the titles. And you can figure out exactly who this guy is. You know what I mean? So it, there are keys to things. And so the paintings, I don't think of a title before I make a painting. I sort of look at the painting and then try to title it. And now that I've titled it so many things, it's getting more and more difficult. <laughs> <The title. laughs> As I get older, what are they? You're going to have to go I, go to some deeper cuts, right? Yeah, deeper things now. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes I repeat things, but not too much. But uh yeah it, it it's a it's a, it's kind of a, because when i paint them uh they take they take me a long time to see them and uh what they are and even if i like them and so um i sit with them and look at them and live with them and uh and then sometimes i can title them quickly but most of the time it takes me you know a week or two to title these things to look at them and live with them and think about what feels right with this you know, I have a lot of sketchbooks. I write things down. I do. I have tons of sketchbooks in the studio. I write things down. I do drawings. I read. I, you know, I get things down. I read a lot. So I get things from what I read. I, I jot things down or something inspires me and I write it down. And then I go to my sketchbooks and I might even look at that and think, well, that would be a good title for this painting. You know, so that's how I do it. 
they're really key to who you know who I am and who made this. You know what this is. So what what are you reading lately? Well, I'm re I'm reading. I read a great book on Billy Holiday. This guy's John Sedgwick uh, interviewed me, mm -hmm. and I read his books on Billy Holiday and, and Miles Davis and Sun Ra. And now I'm reading a book. I don't have the title right now. Um, I don't have it with me, but I'm reading a book on um, the French Revolution, oh. how it came about. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. I mean, it's kind of an academic book for me, so there's a lot of French in it. I don't speak French. But uh, it's about the 18th century, and maybe it's like 25. It's like leading up to the French Revolution, so 25 years, 50 years before the revolution, and what's leading up to it, which I think is so interesting, the time we're living in now. Um and and sort of why it's happening, or what's happening, or what's causing it, or you know how people are feeling. Talking about you know the king, the parliament, the nobility, the poor. You know, so it's very fascinating. You know, I find it very fascinating. So I read everything from like history to you know uh, biographies. I read everything, all kinds of things. You know, um, anybody have a good book, I, I like to read it. You know, so I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not like one, I don't read one kind of thing, all kinds of things. So do, do those inputs find their way into your drawings? Uh, sometimes they, some, they usually find their way into my titles, you know what I mean? Uh, they, <laughs> um, and it makes me think about things and sometimes I think, oh, that would be interesting or, you know, so it, it depends, but not, not my drawings in, in a literal way, uh, but no, more about how I think about things, because you really think about how you get in the studio, or you know how things are flowing to you. I don't, I you know the the painting is really like a mystery, you know. What I mean, in terms of that, you know, in terms of why an artist chooses this color and the subject matter, or how they paint, because because painting is about paint, you know, and um, the big thing is paint, you know, what it is, and then uh, subject matter is kind of very personal, uh, you know. I mean, I'm not, I you know. I, I mean, a good painting is a good painting. I don't care if it's figurative, landscape, whatever. A great painting is a great painting. You know, it's not like, you know, um, I don't care what a couple people paint, and I care about how they paint. You know, in the audio guide for your retrospective at uh, Buffalo AKG Art Museum, there's a brief conversation about uh, one of Norma Cole's poems, Stay Song. Can you talk about the significance of that poem for you and how you draw from that? I, um, that happened early on. I was living in Italy and I did a show in uh, Christine Conan Gallery in Vienna. And I was getting my, my first catalog. And uh, and I was very, Norma Cole, I, I stayed with her when I was in California teaching at Berkeley. And a uh, great poet. And I so I asked her if she'd read a poem for this catalog. And she wrote Stay Song. <clears throat> and, and so then I started making a series of paintings, 40 by 40 paintings, like the 12 by 12 paintings. And I was making so many of them. I couldn't, I couldn't. And when I saw, if I paint a small painting, I don't title the small paintings. Mm -hmm. It's a 24 by 24 or 40 by 40 or 12 by 12. I don't make, I make too many of them. So I, I sort of make a series. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came about. <clears throat> and I, I just like that poem, you know. The poems they stay, um, so that's how that came about, you know. So it was really Norma, who really um, influenced that, and I thought I'd use that, and so I made a few paintings, and then I think now I'm up to a hundred. I don't know what I'm, the name, how many I'm up to now, but the stay song, I think I don't know one hundred and something painting. So that's how that came about, you know. And, I, and I, when I was in San Francisco teaching at Berkeley. Um, I stayed in her house. He had an extra room. Her son had just le uh, left. Um, uh, I went to started going to a lot of poetry readings. You know, in fact, the poet thought I was a poet because I kept I kept coming all the poetry readings, <laughs> but I wasn't a poet. <laughs> but I I just loved it, and um, I think Duncan was alive then. So it was just it was just fascinating to me to be around these poets. You know, I mean, it's a really you know, it's a real writer's town, I thought, you know, so I really enjoyed that, you know, being around all these poets. So it was just fascinating to me to see, you know, and, and poetry, you know, I just went to Alice Notley reading. I, I, I love Alice Notley, too. It's like if you get someone like that, I got to read, because it's so hard to be a great poet. I mean, right. it's so difficult. 
And but when the great poet gets up and reads, it's just you know because people try so hard and they're so dedicated and they really want it really bad. They want to. I mean, poets, you know, they want to be. They really want to be great. But there's some people who just are, you know what I mean? And when those great poets read, it's a whole nother world. You know, it's a right. whole nother. So that was something I realized then that I wanted to have that kind of. Because I, I mean, there are paintings like that for me, you know, like I say, Cezanne's like that for me, a great poet, painter, you know, I think of it that way. And who just opens, opens up a whole kind of universe and, um, some people can do it with words that are just, it's just a magical. Because, you know, it's their voice. You can read the poetry, but their voice, everything is incredible. So that's how that came about. A poet is is trying to use language to express things that aren't expressible in language, which I think exactly. is, which is very yeah. akin yeah. to what, you know, a painter, especially abstract painter, is trying to communicate something that, you can't communicate with language. I can't tell you how many times I talked to a painter and like, I'll try to talk, but I paint because I'm not great with words, right? Yeah, right, right. No, you try to find your medium that you can best express, you know, something in, you know, that's something that's really just what it is to be human, you know, what it is to be a human, what what that is. And so for me, it's painting, yeah. For me, it's paint, you know I mean? It's like me touching the canvas, you know? Uh, it's really about pain. And then you have to find out how, like a poet paint, how, you know, you want to paint, like, you know, like, say, Zom painting with apples. He's like, well, you can't, you know, you can't go there. Uh, it's just what works for you. You know what I mean? Because I always knew what I didn't want to paint. You know what I mean? Right. But I, I couldn't figure out what I want. You know, I didn't want to be a landscape painter. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to, uh, I mean, I wish I was, uh, you know, I love stories, but I wasn't a storyteller in terms of paint. You know, I really just love that paint. You know, I really wanted to make the paint really talk. And so that's how, you know, I, I you know, I had to work real hard to do that. And so I knew I didn't want to do that. I didn't, so I was saying, I don't want to do that. I don't want, then what do you want to do? You know, so, so yeah, it's very akin to, to, to poetry. Yeah, yeah. Stanley, the the show at Gagosian, if people were to make it out to 980 Madison Avenue, what are they going to see? What What's what's new? It's a very <clears throat> interesting question because people... At the party, at the dinner, said, "How are these paintings new when they're, they're the same paintings?" Um, I don't know. I mean, I think just the way I, I, I don't know. Um, they're gonna, they're gonna see, they're gonna, of course, color. And they're gonna see that. They're gonna see sort of. It's not that what it's not that what what they're gonna see. It's sort of what they're gonna experience. Mm. You know, what I mean, what they're gonna experience. It's spoken like a poet. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's it's more about that what they're going to experience. You know, what I mean, that's pretty much it. So far, people are, uh, people. It's been a very positive experience, um, and that's kind of what I want. I kind of want to put, you know, make it that you know, make you know things better. Um, so that I think they'll feel something. I think that if they, no, it's a very positive experience. You know, I mean, you know, you want sort of want to be, you know, it's like. You know, it's like seeing a good sunset or, you know, to see and watching the sun go down or watching the sun come up or, you know, a beautiful day or, you know, or, you know, seeing a loved one or, you know, all those wonderful things, what it is to be human on this planet. You know, kind of, you kind of want that. That's what, I hope that's what they experience. What about scale? Because scale is part of that experience. I mean, do, do you feel like, you could put the same colors down with watercolor in your sketchbook and it's going to be a totally different experience for a viewer. Yeah, it's definitely different. I mean, definitely, you know, whether you look at into it with your eyes or you look at your whole body or have to walk past it. Yeah, it's definitely different. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, this show, I put a lot of drawings in for that. And people like the draw, I think the drawing practice. Um, yeah, it's a different experience. But I mean, it's still kind of a positive experience. I mean, my, I think my work is a positive experience. You know, um, I think it's an uplifting experience. I hope. Well, this conversation has been an uplifting experience for me. Oh, thanks, thanks, I, Stanley. I I appreciate your generosity of time. I know it's a busy week for you. 
uh, it's been an honor to to get to to pick your brain and um, get to talk to you about art. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful voice. Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so do you. You you should uh, you should get into podcasting. So <laughs> no, no, no. Get on no. the radio. We can get you a radio. Maybe you and I can do a radio show on NPR, and we could, uh, you know, we could spin some Thelonious Monk, and then have oh, yeah. uh, somebody, you know, a, a beat poet come up, and uh, we have a slam, and then uh, talk, uh, have uh, some art guests. It uh, that that would be that, that would that sounds good. Really, sounds good. It does. It does. I'm, t- I'm tempted. <laughs> <laughs> that's all the time we have for this week you've been listening to art sense you can find the show on apple Podcasts, itunes google play stitcher radio spotify or your favorite podcast app if you've enjoyed this podcast be sure to subscribe and while you're there please rate the show and leave a quick review your feedback is the key to other folks finding us And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to camvia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at camvia.art. Thanks for listening. (music) 